Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome to this special Robert Louis Stevenson evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here to chair this, uh, this evening. This event uh, kicks off the second previously Scotland's History Festival, a celebration which Edinburgh Napier University is very proud to be uh, part of uh, again this year. And this evening, we're really fortunate to have with us two of this country's finest and most accomplished actors and comedians, <laughs> <laughs> Nigel well, Plainer and that. John Sessions. <laughs> Uh, but beyond that, both of them have in common a great passion and fascination with the life and works of Robert Louis Stevenson. So we're going to hear, obviously, uh, quite a bit from them shortly on that. Uh, but first tonight, um, I want to thank, actually, Edinburgh Napier University's Centre of Literature and Writing. And Linda Dryden's here with us from the university and Edinburgh uh, UNESCO City of Literature, both of which have made this evening possible, uh, as also some of the events that have been going on all across the city today, and both um, Nigel and John have been, I think, moving around the city at great speed, doing readings and various other things, National Portrait Gallery uh, and so on. I understand it's been a hugely successful day. With that, uh, I think it's appropriate that um, we have with us also uh, this evening the Lord Provost of Edinburgh, uh, Donald Wilson, who's going to say a few words about what having a Robert Louis Stevenson Day, an RLS Day, means to the city of Edinburgh. So can I invite him to step forward? Thank you, Joan, uh, and thanks for inviting me along to this final event and what you've already said has been a very full day. And it's uh, very gratifying that this is a, a sellout and it's a full house and uh, to see so many people here. Um, I was very, very pleased and the council was very pleased uh, to, to, to be supporting this celebration uh, for Robert Louis Stevenson's birthday, uh, which a day which thanks to Edinburgh Napier University and, as you've heard, Edinburgh UNESCO City of Literature, is Edinburgh's answer to Dublin's Bloomsday when James Joyce's Ulysses is commemorated in an annual pilgrimage. Edinburgh is extremely proud of its reputation as a city built on books. It became the first UNESCO city of literature in 2004 and is recognized as the capital city of a nation renowned throughout the world for its writers past and present. Stevenson is very much a part of Edinburgh and Scotland's literary history and he remains one of the city's favorite sons. Robert Louis Stevenson Day provides an opportunity for everyone to get involved in celebrating his life and works by participating in a range of fun events. You've already heard about some. There's been a whole host of Stevenson-inspired shenanigans across the city and online. For example, you could have taken part in the Tash mob at Parliament Square where people were invited to don a mustache, if you weren't already growing one for charity, and a velvet jacket and create a cacophony by reading their favorite Stevenson work. You could have had a cup of tea uh, and a cream tart uh, at the former home at 17 Heriot Row while uh, learning about his alter ego, the duplicitous John Libble. Or you could have shared your favorite Robert Louis Stevenson facts on Facebook and Twitter. But whatever celebratory events you've been participating in, I hope you've enjoyed the day and we're very much looking forward to this evening's event. One of the reasons why I was so delighted to come along and uh, support this event is because um, I, ha I have something of a memory uh, of this in that uh, many, many years ago, I was the chair of the Edinburgh and Lothians Tourist Board. And uh, it's uh, so long ago, in fact, that there now isn't an Edinburgh and Lothians Tourist Board. Uh, but when there was one, I was the chair of it. Uh, I have the infamy of being the last chair of it. But uh, uh, anyway, um, a friend that I hadn't been in touch with since secondary school got in touch with me from the borders and said that he um, uh, took uh, a group of friends and they went uh, around uh, Seven 
uh, in order to try and retrace the steps, the steps in the book Travels with the Donkey in the Cévennes. And, uh, but he wanted to come up to Edinburgh and uh, would I, as chair of the tourist board, organize some events for him to go to? And I found it quite difficult. Mm -hmm. So uh, I made a bit of a note that the very first chance I got, I would uh, try and encourage there to be more in the city which celebrates uh, the life and the legacy of uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. And uh, so I'm now happy that, uh, and by the way, if, uh, if Ian Murray is in the audience, if he'd like to get back in touch, I'm the Lord Provost now, so I can sure <laughs> put together a far better itinerary. However, the point is that today is fantastic because it raises the profile and it celebrates the life and the work of Robert Louis Stevenson. And uh, I think that we haven't done enough of it in the past and it's very gratifying that we're actually doing enough of it now because this is fantastic. This is a great step forward. We're very proud of Robert Louis Stevenson through, it, through his work, uh, born and raised in Edinburgh. Uh, he has been a spokesperson for the city and he has spread the fame of the city throughout the world and left a timeless legacy. So we're very proud of him, and it's great that I'm here today to celebrate with you that work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Donald. Um, just before we start, can I just uh, say that we are filming tonight's uh, event, and I'm sure some of you will want to take perhaps personal photographs, so if you could save that until the end, we'd be very uh, grateful. We will be hoping to have questions at the end. It uh, depends on uh, my colleagues here oh, sitting lovely. with me, uh, but I'm sure we'll be able to take questions at the end from uh, the floor, so you can start thinking about those now. Uh, but that said, I'm sure you're itching to know uh, the role that <coughs> Robert Louis Stevenson has played in the lives of our guests here this evening, so with that, we'll get going. Um, if I may, first question um, to both of you, John, Nigel, um, you're here to celebrate the... Uh, inaugural uh, event for previously Scotland's history, which is RLS Day. Um, Stevenson, clearly, as we've heard from the Lord Provost, is much a part of Edinburgh and indeed Scotland's literary history. Uh, but some would argue it's been quite neglected until fairly recently. So I was wondering if you could perhaps both say what RLS Day, having an RLS Day means to you, what it might mean to yes. Edinburgh and Scotland. We've heard a little bit about that, but from your personal perspectives. Well, it's interesting um, why he's been neglected, and I suppose the, the, the biggest thing staring one in the face, that he did spend most of his life trying to get away from Edinburgh. <laughs> um, he he travelled all around the world uh, for, most of his, for most of his life, um, one of his early books was Ordered South. The doctors ordered him to go south, to the south of France, for the, for the climate. And the health was always used as, a, as an excuse to get away from the harsh wind that you have here. Um, and he just uh, uh, spent a lot of time getting away from it. But he also spent a lot of time writing about it, as the Lord Provost said. Around the world, he's referring uh, everything back to Edinburgh. I personally, to answer the question, uh, to say that what it means to me, it, me it means a hell of a lot to me. He was, he was incredibly uh, famous at the time and seems to have slipped away now. In fact, when he went to New York after writing Jekyll and Hyde, when he got off the, the boat, he was mobbed in, in America. He was considerably more... Uh, famous, popular than he was, and they did it the way the Americans only can. They absolutely mobbed him and were offering him everything. In fact, he said words to the effect of if, if, if Jesus Christ had got off the boat, there would have been less fuss. Um, <laughs> Preempting John Lennon's um, <laughs> famous quote by about 100 years. Um, so, I mean, to me, it, it, I'm from London, um, but he's... I mean, it's a sort of personal story I've been through for, for, for the last few years, following up his life. Um, I don't know why he's been ignored, possibly because of the, the snobbish London literary scene that he aspired to and then left. There's been a lot of sort of squeezing him out. I think there's been a, there was a lot of censorship 
of, his, of where he was going, which is why he uh, traveled so far, uh, not just from the London literary scene and his, his own editors, but also from his father. Um, so it, it's, it's a mystery why is he, you know, why he sort of disappeared from here and has disappeared from preeminence. I think he's being reassessed at the moment as a great literary figure, and I'm, I'm all for that because I think he is a great literary figure, and I think it's wonderful that Edinburgh's sort of taking that on board and we're doing something about it. Maybe now. we'll pick I up on that in a moment. It's like yeah. Fred Astaire. Yeah. Fred Astaire or Cary Grant had lightness of touch. We know Fred Astaire was a prodigious dancer. Uh, but he could do things lightly, and Stevenson had a lightness of touch to his work, in my humble opinion. And he wrote romances. And people think, oh, romances, they're, they're poor relations to great serious novels and great serious fiction. No, they take great skill. And uh, not only did he write romances, he wrote the greatest romances in the English language, I think. Notably, Kidnapped and Do um, Treasure Island. Also, it could be argued to a lesser extent, Katrina and Master of Malantre. He was also the man who seemed to pull together, rather like Hercules or, the, or Samson, I'm thinking of, pushing aside the columns. He pulled together the 18th century uh, Edinburgh of David Hume and Adam Smith and the super rationalism and reinvested the 18th century with two great characteristics. I mean, he, in Kidnap, we get what well, are the two great 18th century events for, in Scotland? the Jacobite tragedy, and pirates, and guys like that. Pirates, buccaneers, corsairs, those sort of people. And he wrote the two absolutely unimprovable books on those subjects, Kidnapped and, and uh, Treasure Island. Anyway, that's what I okay. think. And, and what you... <laughs> I mean, what you're both saying, I think, is that you know, he has been reclaimed as a writer of quality and gaining, achieving his rightful yeah, for about place. As, 30, 40 as years, I think. To... It's not that. It's, uh -huh. Yeah, I think people suddenly went, oh, well, there's that terrible snobbishness. It's like we get in our business of, you know, tragedians and people who do plays about Auschwitz are taken very seriously. But somebody who comes through a door, trips over and picks up a, a glass of water, that's kind of cheap, that's comedy, that's a poor relation. In the same way as if somehow writing for children makes you a poor relation. Mm. Um, to, to, to write as well as Stevenson did for children, of course, is, is, is remarkable. Well, and Henry James said, words to the effect of, oh, he did, Stevenson continues to pretend that he's writing for children and yeah. getting away with it, as, as it were. Yes, yeah, I've got a because wee line of, Stephen, of, of Henry James. Oh, go on. Can I, <laughs> sorry, no. No, 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 go on, finish? yeah, let's have more um, it, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a sweet, beautifully written. I, I did my MA on Henry James, so I love Henry James, and I love James Joyce, and I love Robert Louis Stevenson. So I got that out of the way. Anyway, um, uh, James, who was a very close friend of Stevenson, has just heard that Stevenson has died. And he writes to his friend, Edmund Goss, I meant to write to you tonight on another matter, but of what can one think, or utter, or dream, save of this ghastly extinction of the beloved RLS. It is too miserable for cold words. It is an absolute desolation. It makes me cold and sick, and with the absolute, almost alarmed sense of the visible, material quenching of an indispensable light. Great writer, another great writer. The, Something else that's great about Stevenson is that um, I said he, he is a writer of romances. He's also like a romantic with a capital R. He lived the life of adventure that you find Byron and um, Shelley trying to live. You know, he, his life, or, or indeed as Hemingway, I would I have reservations about Hemingway, but you know, you live a life and you also write. You don't just write, as indeed my dear beloved Henry James did. He basically sat at the desk at 32 and didn't stop till he was 70. But whereas Stevenson had these extraordinary adventures, which you all know, 
you know, that's rather like the great moments in the life of the Beatles and the Stones, you know. We all know the, the, uh, the crossing of America, you know, to, to go to Fanny, to say, I have to marry you. All the shenanigans there, the Silverado squatters, going to Davos, eventually going to Samoa, the death in Samoa. It's all so vivid, it's all so extraordinary, colorful. The period in France when he meets Fanny, of course, at the Barbizon School. And uh, I'm talking too much. No, just, <laughs> <laughs> well, can, can, can I link that back to something that you said as well about that he's pretending he's still writing for, for children, and Henry James said that. He also said something interesting, which was that um, he should write more about women. Uh, mm. Is Stevenson really a boy's own writer? I mean, you talked about... Well, you know, certainly the, um, the, the Sea include, Cook, yeah. which was Treasure Island, the, the first draft of Treasure Island, was written for, a, I think, a magazine called Stories for Boys. Or, uh, it w he was definitely writing for boys. He said for boys. But at the time, I, d I don't know if there were any magazines which said stories for girls. Uh, you know, I think girls have changed... Probably in the last hundred years. Girls did needlepoint and just behaved. <laughs> yeah. Simple as that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. he, he also came a cropper, I believe, after writing uh, Prince Otto, which had some mm -hmm. quite saucy women characters in it. And after that, he said, uh, I'm, I'm going to do without them um, because it, it didn't quite work. I don't think he was quite that pleased with Prince Otto. I'm not sure. But uh, he, he decided to not to write for women characters, and I think it's only, I believe, when he, when he gets to the South Sea Tales later in his career, particularly the beach at Falasar, where the women characters start to take over. I mean, the, the wife in, in the beach at Falasar is actually the action hero. She's the one who does the shooting. She's the one who rescues him from the, from the baddie. Um, and I think he was... I think he was just getting onto something, uh, uh, and then he died, um, unfortunately. But I, he definitely had a, um, a, a not a problem, but he, he he was not writing for women particularly or about them. But was that the was that the order of the day to be well, doing so? Because it, because it's interesting you say about the, the cross fertilization between him and Henry James. James, he said to James, Henry, you've got to make things happen. And Henry <laughs> says to, to Louis, um, you've got to go inside the characters more. Yes. And even when, as I hope is demonstrable in um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, even when um, Stevenson is mining the, the unconscious and all the Freudian stuff that has been said about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, it still sort of moves, it's got action to it. Yeah, There's yeah. real action even to interior monologues, whereas with my beloved Henry, you know, it's, it's all, all interior monologues. It's very yeah, interior yeah. monologues and not a lot of action. A lot of tea stirring, but, uh, <laughs> you know, no bears coming in the windows or Red Indians. Or... Do you think that that's a possible uh, reason why he's been somewhat ignored, the, ac the amount of action he put in? Um, yeah, I think that, everybody that thought, well, this people is People haven't easy. taken he's, that seriously. He's like a kid's a, writer, you know. He's, he's kind of, you know, Alexander Dumas, he's okay, but, you know, see, for me, Dumas is the French Stevenson. Dumas feast, that is, you know. I know I, I love the, the novels of Honoré de Balzac, the great French writer. Um, you know, The Three Musketeers is, once again, it's a, it has a Stevensonian panache to it. And um, yeah, and of, and of course, there's of, uh, and there's many of Stevenson's books being turned into films. Just picking yeah. up on on um, the film adaptations, John. I know you're particularly interested in that side of it as well. Could you give us well, a I, clue as to I which is your say, favourite film? I have or? to say, my favourite uh -huh. is the 1971-72 version of Kidnapped, with Michael Caine <laughs> as Alan Breck. <laughs> I think it's one of the funniest things. <laughs> now, Davy, you've got to get up on that hillside and bleed it out, redcoats. Get those bloody redcoats off the hill. Now, David, I know you're a nice boy and all of that, but I can't understand a bleeding word you're saying. And I just think um, it's very, very funny. It's very, very funny. And uh, Nigel and I were talking earlier about David. You know, it's very... David's often played as a piece of Jesse, you know, 
you know, Alan, stop that, you know. And uh, it's, it's very easy to go into comedy to flip over from the Stevensonian world and make, have a bit of fun with David, it has to be said. The, uh, I like the two early Jekyll and Hyde's. There was the 1931 two version with Frederick March, a very fine actor, Frederick March, very handsome guy. Um, and I think more successful even than the Spencer Tracy version in the 1940s. I just, for me, Frederick March was very special. Uh, Spencer Tracy was too. But uh, then, of course, there is the one. If RLS had been around, he would have made a fortune. The Disney version with, of course, Robert Newton yeah. as of, of Treasure Island living. That's the one I remember. Yeah, the one we all remember. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I think we all remember that one from yeah. <laughs> And you know, everyone, everyone's the color of tandoori chicken. It's that wonderful, <laughs> that wonderful saturated technicolor. And when was it made? 1959, I 60, thereabouts? No, no, it must have been earlier. No, no, no. Because uh, Newton died in the 50s. <laughs> Astonishing. It was such a great performance for a man who was ragingly drunk. I mean, not to digress too much, but in one of his last uh, occasions when he was filming Robert Newton, he was on a set, and there was a bar that was a set of a bar, and he was so out of it, he thought he was in a bar. <laughs> and he was, he was asking this poor young lad, who was an extra, you know, get me a effing drink, you know, and very tragic. And poor Bobby Driscoll, who played uh, Jack Hawkins, uh, died at the age of 30 from heroin. It was very, very mm -hmm. sad, very mm -hmm. sad. Mm -hmm. But a, a great adaptation. I think Stevenson would have loved it. I mean, I remember when I first saw it, I was, the thing that really frightened me was uh, Blind Pew, yeah. played by the great John Laurie. Mm -hmm. And uh, what were we talking about earlier? We were talking, yeah, earlier on today, we had to read some excerpts. We, we arrived at the, uh, the portrait gallery, and they basically said, read this, read this. And there were two bits of Treasure Island. And Nigel and I had no idea what we were doing, what we were going to do. And I got the death of Israel Hands. And, Lucky. Yeah, and, <laughs> and Nigel got the return. The next bit, yeah, yeah. Jim's wounded return to the, the, the what's the word? Stockade. Stockade. Middle senior moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I've run out of gas yeah. there. Well, yeah. <laughs> you, I mean, do you think, just on the last point yeah, yeah. on the films, do you think that the Sorry. films rather than the books actually enhance Stevenson's popularity? No, coming back to a point that Nigel's making about the women and the Stevenson's late, latter, more frank and sensual treatment of women, there is the violence towards women mm. in the 41s. And this is, mm. I don't know if it was pre Hayes Committee, it must have been post Hayes, I would have thought. The murder of the prostitute is really not nice at all. It's not even as tasteful as um, the death of Nancy in David Lean's Oliver Twist. It's, uh, it's very brutal. It's very ugly. Mm. Nigel, I know that your interest really lies in the travels and the mm -hmm. writings of um, RLS. What triggered your interest particularly in that side of, of him? Um, I don't know. I think it's a, a, a personal thing, the idea of... Um, I, I was very interested in his argument with his, with his father, with his parents, and the, the, the idea of getting away and uh, 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 moving on to, in, in the short time that we've got in life is to see as much as you can and to, and to move away. And I like that, you know, my feeling with the travel writing that he did is that he was really a precursor to, the, to what we now call travel writing in that, you know, maybe before him, I haven't read Humboldt, so I don't, I don't know his work, but I believe before Stevenson, there's all of the, all of the great sailors, you'd have, they'd write a record of their voyage and they'd make a lot of money, Dampier and Bly and mm. Cook, and you'd get people's journeys and then they'd write up or have ghost written for them if they had trouble with it. And th these were bestsellers, people couldn't wait to see that. But with Stevenson, you get something different, which I think we can now identify with, which is the journey as a metaphor, a personal journey that he's also going on. And also, you get the journey that he's gone on to write the book which is much more like modern travel writing. You get, you, the journey is, the book is the journey, the journey is the book, and you... Amateur emigrant, yeah. or what about many, yeah, many yeah. examples, yes. 
and you also hear the effect, he creates the characters, he does the research, I mean he creates, he, he reports the characters, but he also describes himself uh, and the effect the journey is having on him, which is a, a, a sort of fictionalization of his own life. And as John was saying, he had the, I believe, I, I find myself more excited by reading the, the stories of his, his adventures than I do about his adventure stories. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because the adventure stories, as you say, we've seen the movies now, we can see uh, offshoots of his creations. Um, Jekyll and Hyde, I was wondering recently, would, would we have Superman, Batman? Would we have those kind of superheroes without, the, without Stevenson behind all this? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is less exciting to me than, than real adventures, when they were really in danger, when they were uh, sailing across the South Seas. Those were unnavigable seas. There's a, there's a lovely scene in, in scene, you see, I'm saying it as if it's a scene. It actually happened. Um, I think it's called Atuona Bay, when they first hit the Marquesa Islands, and about 50 islanders swim in, into the cabin where he's trying to write. This is in his book, The South Seas, which is a travel book and they, they, they invade the ship, and the, the, there's a woman in her grass skirt who makes a squeaky noise on the leather seat, mm -hmm. um, which they all laugh at, and it's all very funny, but these were cannibals. It was only a few years previously they'd fattened up Her Herman Melville to try and eat him, um, <laughs> and he'd made a narrow escape. Uh, and these were people who, who you know, would have captured him and fed him up and eaten him. Um, Taken and a bit of fattening up. Yes, he would have taken yeah. a bit of fattening yeah. up. I think he even refers to that. He's a, a bag of, you know, bag of bones in a sack, isn't he? Someone yeah. described. And you can tell where he got it from. He got it from his mother because his mother, when she was nearly Bonefin, sixty, yes, yes. goes off to the South Seas with him. You know, and uh, they're on this boat. They, they get to Papiati, then they, they sail on to Samoa eventually, they're, and they're going through some real typhoons almost, you know. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And dear old Maggie Stevenson's up there on the deck going, this is lovely, you know. <laughs> yeah. She's six years old. That's right. It's but at, at that time, he still describes how he's got, he's aware of where he's put the guns, mm -hmm. but he's being very, very mm -hmm. uh, polite mm -hmm. to them. He knows he's got a pistol in the, mm -hmm. and he hangs on to that. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's a, that's a much more exciting adventure story because I can imagine myself in that. Whereas when it comes to the, the, the fictionalized ones. Yeah. I don't find them, and I like the psychology of it as well with his, with the very strange psychology of his marriage with Fanny Stevenson. What do, what do you think the impact mm. of, I mean, people talk about him getting away from Edinburgh, but you know, the traveling was what it was it's about. Like Joyce with Edinburgh, yeah. he's, he's very ambivalent, you know. I mean, he, did he love it? I'm not sure he did love it. I don't think he did love Edinburgh. I think the well, we had that marvellous thing yeah. uh, last year. We had um, Ian Rankin reading out from um, picturesque notes, yes. and they're very satirical, but places in Edinburgh I've never heard of, but, mm. but Stevenson describing. Uh, it, 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 it was quite wry. His, his, it was a love-hate relationship, I think. If Edinburgh is his really cloudy gum, you know. He's but on the domestic front, what, do you, what, what impact do you think it had on his family life or his family back home? Um, what, what effect did his, sorry? His absence from Edinburgh or being away, I mean, there was his relationship with his father, clearly, uh, but then, as you say, his mother went and lived with him out well, there. Then they came back, with he, he brings Fanny back, kind of, he brings yeah. Fanny back, they marry, whatever, and then his father develops something I know very well, my father had this dementia, mm -hmm. and um, the, I, I wrote a play about Stevenson, and uh, Nigel has written a play about Stevenson, and uh, I dealt with that quite, quite a bit. Uh, the, 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 the collapse of the great Lighthouse Stevenson, Thomas Stevenson, the father, you know. I think he was, um, there was a day when he um, confessed to his father that he'd lo lost his belief in, in God, mm. and uh, that was quite a big rift. And I think that some of his journey, his, you know, his traveling was to get away from the influence of his father, I, I, I think, because his father was, I mean, 
There was one book, didn't he, buy back all the copies. His father bought Herbert back. Herbert Spencer? Was it Herbert Spencer? I don't know what the book was. but it was a big but, atheist at the time. Um, no, his father bought back mm. all the copies of the Stevenson oh, book. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. So, rather than have other people mm. read it. Mm. Right. Um, and he, he was quite an impressive father with the amateur emigrant. They, he disapproved uh, very, very strongly of the, the sequence in the Chinese railway compartment yes. where all the Chinese emigrants are. And uh, that never got printed until after Stevenson's death. I think there was quite a lot of uh, suppression of what he was trying to say, it, actually. It myself. took him a long time to be successful. And he didn't, I mean, his writing about the canoe voyages in, yeah. uh, you know, and it, it's pretty good, but it's not, it's not great stuff. You know, he, it took him 10, 15 years to grow into Treasure Island, I think. I think there's an, there's an argument to say he sort of spread himself too thin. He was very generous spirited man yes. who uh, would co-write with anybody. And I think he wasted a lot of time like that. W.E. Henley. W.E. Henley, the plays. And was then a hustler. He, he wrote with his stepson and he wrote with Fanny. They, they wrote books. They had all that trouble over the Nixie, the story that Fanny had yes. nicked the story from somebody else. And he, he, he spent a lot of time trying to uh, enable everybody who was with him to share in this, yes. in, his, in his own talent, if you ask me. And yes. I think he sort of spread himself rather thinly. And as you say, it took him a long time to, to, to finally but find when he focus, hit it, and then he died. There's a perfection to Treasure Island. It's just, you go, this is unimprovable, you know. And, um, but yeah, sorry, I'm repeating myself. I mean, he, but once, he, I mean, once there, you know, I mean, what was the one? The Black Arrow was a, was a disaster. Disaster of a book, not just commercially, but even as a piece of writing. Katrina does not really fulfill the promise, as you might say, of the perfect kidnapped. Uh, Master of Ballantrae is, is a good novel, is a good novel, I would say. Um, and then, as Nigel was saying, the, the, the late work, when, you know, if only he'd had another 10, 15 years, yeah. I think we'd yeah. have seen some extraordinary stuff. And something else Nigel and I have been talking about is the elision. We've talked about Jameson and Stevenson, but the elision of Stevenson into the most extraordinary writer of the South Seas and, the, and uh, Indochina in the most metaphysical and profound way, Joseph Conrad. There's a lot to Stevenson, I believe, that prepares the way. I, I wish I knew, I don't sadly know, the extent to which um, Conrad would have read Stevenson. Well, I, Conrad was very, very tetchy about that. He, oh, uh, really? Yes, well, he, you said, don't, don't mix me a, with that guy. Yeah, no, he right. said, uh, I haven't read The Ebb Tide, and then he admitted he had read The Ebb Tide. And oh, then right. there's a whole... Um, uh, uh, Professor Linda Dryden here is, a, is the expert on knowing exactly how much leakage there was. Oh, but okay. There is... A, you, you've hit on it, yes. I mean, yeah. there was actually more leakage to Conrad than Conrad would care to admit. Right. Mm. Interesting. Which is an interesting uh, You kind of got a bit Polish place. about it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, obviously the travels and the writing and so on, and you said there's references back to Edinburgh and, of course, the Highlands and Islands mm. uh, as well, provided some wonderful locations for films, John. Mm. Maybe you'd like to just tell oh, us... Oh, gosh, about I quite don't know. Of um, the, the, well, Scotland looks great on a rainy, rainy day. I was just talking to people beforehand. Uh, when Robbie Coltrane and I played Boswell and Dr. Johnson, we were filming, so it's just a slight digression. It's, you know, you know what the Western Isles are like in March. Well, we were there in March. We were in Edinburgh for the first part of the filming to do all the interiors of Johnson and Boswell. Then we went, we had two weeks shooting on the Western Isles in March. And if, if we had one or two days of rain, we were finished. Our schedule was ruined. And John Byrne, who wrote and directed the film, says, it will not rain, Johnny. It will be fine. There will no rain. Like an old Red Indian or something. And, you know, not only did it not rain, it was like grease <laughs> for a fortnight. <laughs> and I don't know if you know Marl and Iona, that blazing white sand, you know, the amazing church where uh, John Smith was buried, uh, the Fina Fort crossing to Iona, the water blazing cobalt, you know, we're playing football at lunchtime with our shirts off. In the day was days where one took one's shirt off. And um, yes, it was magical. But to pick up on Joan's point there, um, yes, if you, you the, the flight on the heather and all the rest of it with David and uh, and Alan Breck, you know, you, you know, 
only a very bad filmmaker <laughs> um, would not be able to get good Scotland in the background. Okay. We've, we've touched on Stevenson's untimely death. Um, Nigel, your play about Stevenson's death or mm -hmm. his last um, days, um, coinciding with that of Gauguin in Death of Long Pig, mm -hmm. um, that had obviously, both of those things had an influence and, and the location um, in the South Seas had an in influence on your yeah, play. Maybe yeah. you can tell us a little bit about what was you know, in your thinking about that. Um, well, the thinking was to sort of follow the Stevenson trail. Um, I had to write a play at the end of it <laughs> to justify the research <laughs> period. Um, I, managed to, I managed to write a load of articles to pay for, for the trip. Um, and I went to Vilima, Samoa. I went all around the Marquesa Islands um, on this cargo passenger boat. Um, with all my Stevenson books with me, um, and the Herman Melville. Um, and I also went to Monterey in, in California, in the west coast of California, because the furniture from Harriet Row here um, um, was shipped out to Samoa when he got there. He, sh he shipped out mm. his mother, as John says, but he also shipped out a lot of heavy furniture and his pen and his socks are there and his boots and a lot of, a lot of items. And then when he died, his uh, stepdaughter, Belle, had them shipped back to Monterey, where he'd been previously. And, and, and they're now in the French house, where, where a Frenchman had picked him up when he was half dead in Monterey on the journey when he'd, when he'd gone to um, claim his wife, Fanny. Um, and the furniture from Edinburgh is sitting in Monterey now. Um, and you can get to go around and see it, you ring the, the museum proprietor, and he takes you around. It's not just the furniture, though. It's, it's many, many of the possessions, the personal possessions. It's like looking when you've just moved into a house, and, and there's all the things just, just sitting there. It's in, in Monterey, of all places. You made me feel like a real old chancer, you know, because I, I, I wrote a radio play on Radio 4 about 10 years ago when I played Stevenson, um, Yes, on radio, it's all right for me to play Stevenson. <laughs> uh, not, maybe not on telly, not ideal casting. Um, and Mrs. Hughes from Downton Abbey, my dear friend Phyllis Logan, I cast as Fanny. Um, but, I mean, just to hear Nigel, no idea you'd done all that. Oh, no, I did all that. And then I thought, oh, I'd better write a play now. because I've. Oh, well, <laughs> absolutely. That's the fun bit, surely. The yeah. research is the fun bit. I just read books about it. And yeah. Wrote, yeah. But, um, yes, it was a... It, it was a marvellous experience to climb up the mountain where he's buried. Amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and go to the grave there with his verse, the famous verse on one mm -hmm. side, and then there's the other verse that he wrote for Fanny, which is actually not quite as good as the... It's, you know, his one's great, dig the grave yeah. and let yeah. me lie. Let me lie. Glad yeah. did I live and gladly die. And then the other side is, oh, oh and her as well, she's a great... <laughs> you know, <laughs> she's... She's honestly my best friend, yeah. or something like uh, that. Because it all went a bit. I mean, but she didn't want to be there. The she's not. Well, she's not there. That's just a fact for her. She's. I think her ashes were taken again to California. She uh, went and she outlived him by some years and remarried in in, uh, in California. Yeah. True to his early writings, then he didn't do too well writing about women. Yes. <laughs> yes it's it's very sad. The end of the life. It's a, you, you. You kind of like it to him. You, you sort of think, oh, Samoa, okay, uh, idyll, and then he dies, which is sad, but at least he died in a lovely Pacific situation. Not at all. There was a civil war going on in Samoa. Uh, Lloyd was a spendthrift, was a pain in the neck, was a, a brothel. Uh, no, that's Joe, you're thinking. I'm um, Joe Austin, Joe, sorry. Joe sorry, Strong, no, no, no. Joe Strong. But L Lloyd yeah. really didn't cut it. Lloyd was a, a wastrel, really, I mean, fair well, to say. Don't you think? I don't know. He, he was a tough upbringing. Let's yeah, face it. He loved. Yeah, he loved Lloyd. I think. He loved. Yeah. But that's it. He did love Lloyd. But Lloyd. Lloyd let him down big time. And um, and his relations. What I was meaning to get to. His relations with Fanny were getting very ambivalent. I think, as you were saying earlier, yeah. when we were in the the park, that uh, he did fall in love with Belle. I think the daughter, 
of that. Well, that's the John Kearney theory, isn't it? I'm well, not sure I'm, I go I'm along with I'm kind of with John Kearney on that. I think he did as well. And because Fanny, Fanny could be a bit of a Yoko Ono, you know, she was, um, <laughs> you know, a big old, big old boiler, as we would say in Glasgow. A bit of a boiler. <laughs> And, uh, you know, she could shoot the heads off rattlesnakes as well. I mean, yeah, she, was, she, yeah. was no, she was no cream puff. And, um, and coming back to it, I seemed a very strange woman. And she was considerably older than him as well. It was like he kind of married his mum or something, you know. He was, but then, you know, the, the, the more mm. red-blooded Stevenson, the, the, the blood that wasn't coming out of his lungs, you know, made him fall in love with Belle, I think, yes. Mm. And she, I think, returned the attentions to some extent, to a large extent. And uh, that, and Fanny, Fanny was very ill, wasn't she, in the last... She, she, ne she nearly went completely around the bend I think about she did. two years before uh, yeah. he died. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, absolutely mentally ill. Yeah. Uh, I, I know this point in the evening, you've both brought along some passages from Stevenson that um, you're going to read to us. Uh, that means something to you, and perhaps to say something about what it is that you, you've chosen to read and, well, and why. And I'm going to start Sorry, uh, with Joe, you, John. Jumping, jumping. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. I, I was going to start because, well, not spoil it. I just thought it was best to be end the night. Um, I'm going to read, first of all, uh, the, a, a good section of The Quarrel from Kidnapped. Uh, after they've been at Clooney's and Alan Breck has gambled away the money, and David's Presbyterian rectitude asserts itself against this, uh, what did he say in 1066 and all that about the Cavaliers? The wrong but romantic Alan Breck. At last, upon the other side of Loch Erech, going over a smooth, rushy place where the walking was easy, he could bear it no longer and came close to me. Can I start that again? Sorry. At last, upon the other side of Loch Erech, going over a smooth, rushy place where the walking was easy, he could bear it no longer and came close to me. David, says he, this is no way for two friends to take a small accident. I have to say that I'm sorry, and so that's said. And now, if you have anything, you'd better say it. Oh, says I. I have nothing. He seemed disconcerted, at which I was meanly pleased. No, said he with rather a trembling voice. But when I say I was to blame, why, of course you were to blame, said I, not at all coolly. And you will bear me out that I have never reproached you. Never, says he. But you can very well that they've done worse. Are we to part? You said so once before. Are you to say it again? There's hills and heather enough between here and the two seas, David. And I will own I'm no very keen to stay where I'm no wanted. This pierced me like a sword and seemed to lay bare my private disloyalty. Alan Breck, I cried, and then, do you think I'm one to turn my back on you in your chief need? You dustn't say it to my face. My whole conduct's there to give the lie to it. It's true. I fell asleep upon the muir, but that was from weariness, and you do wrong to cast it up to me, which is what I never did, said Alan. But aside from that, I continued, what have I done that you should even me, that you should even me to dogs by such a supposition? I never yet failed a friend, and it's not likely I'll begin with you. There are things between us that I can never forget. Even if you can, I will only say this to you, David, said Alan, quietly, that I've long been owing you my life, and now I owe you money. 
You should try to make that burden light for me. This ought to have touched me, and in a manner it did, but the wrong manner. I felt I was behaving badly, and was now not only angry with Alan, but angry with myself in the bargain, and it made me the more cruel. You ask me to speak, said I. Well then, I will. You own yourself that you have done me a disservice. I have had to swallow an affront. I have never reproached you. I never named the thing till you did. And now you blame me, cried I, because a canny laugh and sing as if I was glad to be affronted. The next thing will be that I'm to go down upon my knees and thank you for it. You should think more of others, Alan Breck. If ye thought more of others, ye would perhaps speak less about yourself. And when a friend that likes you very well has passed over an offence without a word, ye would be blithe to let it lie instead of making it a stick to break his back with. By your own way of it, it was you that was to blame. And it shouldn't it be you to seek the quarrel. Ah, well, said Alan. Say no more. And we fell back into our former silence and came to our journey's end and supped and lay down to sleep without another word. Thank you. <laughs> moving, moving rapidly on here, <coughs> we've got Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and I'm going to read the conclusion of it, which I recorded a few years ago. It is the most disturbing stuff. It really is. I mean, dear old... Louis with his sparkling eyes and his little goatee. You forget that guy when you read this. I was stepping leisurely across the court after breakfast, drinking the chill of the air with pleasure, when I was seized again with those indescribable sensations that heralded the change and I had but the time to gain the shelter of my cabinet before I was once again raging and freezing with the passions of Hyde. It took on this occasion a double dose to recall me to myself, and alas, six hours after, as I sat looking sadly in the fire, the pangs returned, and the drug had to be re-administered. In short, from that day forth, it seemed only by a great effort, as of gymnastics, and only under the immediate stimulation of the drug, that I was able to wear the countenance of Jekyll. At all hours of the day and night, I would be taken with a premonitory shudder. Above all, if I slept or even dozed for a moment in my chair, it was always as Hyde that I awakened under the strain of this continually impending doom and by the sleeplessness to which I now condemned myself. I, even beyond what I had thought possible to man, I became in my own person a creature eaten up and emptied by fever, languidly weak, both in body and mind, and solely occupied by one thought, the horror of my other self. But when I slept, or when the virtue of the medicine wore off, I would leap almost without transition, for the pangs of transformation grew daily less marked. Into the possession of a fancy brimming with images of terror, 
a soul boiling with causeless hatreds, and a body that seemed not strong enough to contain the raging energies of life. The powers of Hyde seemed to have grown with the sickliness of Jekyll, and certainly the hate that now divided them was equal on each side. With Jekyll, it was a thing of vital instinct. He had now seen the full deformity of that creature that shared with him some of the phenomena of consciousness and was co heir with him to death. And beyond these links of community, which in themselves made the most poignant part of his distress, he thought of Hyde for all his energy of life as of something not only hellish but inorganic. This was the shocking thing, that the slime of the pit seemed to utter cries and voices, that the amorphous dust gesticulated and sinned, that what was dead and had no shape should usurp the offices of life. And this again, that the insurgent horror was knit to him closer than a wife, closer than an eye, lay caged in his flesh when he heard it mutter and felt it struggle to be born and at every hour of weakness and in the confidences of slumber prevailed against him and deposed him out of life. The hatred of Hyde for Jekyll was of a different order. His terror of the gallows drove him continually to commit temporary suicide and return to his subordinate station of a part, of a part instead of a person. But he loathed the necessity. He loathed the despondency into which Jekyll was now fallen. And he resented the dislike with which he was himself regarded. Hence the ape-like tricks that he, would, that he would play me, scrawling in my own hand, blasphemies on the page of my books, burning the letters and destroying the portrait of my father, and indeed, ah! it had not been for his fear of death. He would long ago have ruined himself in order to involve me in the ruin. But his love of life is wonderful. I go further. I who sicken and freeze at the mere thought of him, when I recall the abjection and passion of this attachment, and when I know how he fears my power to cut him off by suicide, I find it in my heart. to pity him. It is useless. The time awfully fails me to prolong this description. No one has ever suffered such torments. Let that suffice. And yet, even to these, habit brought, no, not alleviation, but a certain callousness of soul a certain acquiescence of despair. And my punishment might have gone on for years, but for the last calamity which has now fallen and which has finally severed me from my own face and nature, my provision of the salt which had never been renewed since the date of the first experiment began to run low. I sent out for a fresh supply and mixed the draft. The ebullition followed and the first change of color, not the second, 
I drank it, and it was without efficiency. You will learn from Poole how I have had London ransacked. It was in vain. And I am now persuaded that my first supply was impure and that it was that unknown impurity which lent efficacy to the draught. About a week has passed and I am now finishing this statement under the influence of the last of the old powders. This then is the last time, short of a miracle, that Henry Jekyll can think his own thoughts or see his own face now, how sadly altered in the glass. Nor must I delay too long to bring my writing to an end. For if my narrative has hitherto escaped destruction, it has been by a combination of great prudence and great good luck. Should the throes of change take me in the act of writing it, Hyde will tear it to pieces. But if some time shall have elapsed after I have laid it by, his wonderful selfishness and circumscription to the moment will probably save it once again from the action of his ape-like spite. And indeed, the doom that is closing on us both has already changed and crushed him. Half an hour from now, when I shall again and forever re that hated personality, I know how I shall sit, shuddering and weeping in my chair, or continue with the most strained and fear-struck ecstasy of listening, to pace up and down this room, my last earthly refuge and give ear to every sound of menace. Will Hyde die upon the scaffold? Or will he find the courage to release himself at the last moment? God knows I am careless. This is my true hour of death. And what is to follow concerns another than myself. Here then, as I lay down the pen and proceed to seal up my confession, I bring the life of that unhappy Henry Jekyll to an end. Thank you very much. That was really powerful. Nigel, I know that um, part of what you picked to read to us tonight is, uh, I think you're going to start with one of the letters. I know that the letters um, mean quite a lot to you. You're very interested in that. Yes. Um, maybe I can ask you to begin. Yeah. Um, I'm reading from the letters, but the, the, uh, specifically right now, because the good news is that um, Ernest Mehew, who was the Stevenson scholar who, who uh, edited these letters, um, his archive is now in the possession, is here, and is in the possession of Edinburgh Napier University. So we're going to celebrate that and read some of the letters. Um, how, how long have we got, though? Shall I read um. one of the letters? Yes, I would say. One. What, because of that selfish bug that of, went yeah. on for so long? <laughs> I'm sorry. No, because sorry. of Sir John. <laughs> because of Sir John I think, Sessions. I think we're okay. <laughs> um, I'll, read, I'll read one. And we're, uh, we're, oh, uh, nice. Read two. Yeah, no, Come a couple. On. Yes, a well, couple of those, I think. A couple. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I went on well, I was we were talking about his, his uh, uh, father earlier. This is... Uh, a letter to Francis Sitwell, another, another fanny, um, who he had uh, a major crush on early on in his, his life. She was uh, married, but um, he, 
saw her, he, he went to see her in Norfolk and, and was very much in love with her. And uh, around the time that he told his father he no longer believed, uh, he was hanging out with cousin Bob as well, who his father saw as a very bad influence. Um, I like and, cousin Bob. Yeah, cousin Bob was, was uh, they were being very bohemian together. And this is, just, I think, a very telling letter to describe maybe some of the um, uh, sort of terror that he, uh, that he felt with his, with his father. Um, his father has interviewed Bob, and he has been excluded from the room. My father's interview with Bob has been long coming and has now come. I'm so tired at heart and tired in my body that I can only tell you the result tonight. They shook hands. My father said that he wished him all happiness but prayed him as the one favour that could be done him that he should never see him between the eyes again. And so parted my father and my friend. Tomorrow I shall give more details. Wednesday. The war began with my father accusing Bob of having ruined his house and his son. Bob answered that he didn't know where I had found out that the Christian religion was not true, but that he hadn't told me. <laughs> and I think from that point, the conversation went off into emotion and never touched shore again. There was not much said about me. My views, according to my father, are a childish imitation of Bob. To cease the moment the mildew is removed. All that was said was that I had ceased to care for my father and that my father confessed he was ceasing or had greatly ceased to care for me. Indeed, the object of the interview is not very easy to make out. It had no practical issue except the ludicrous one that Bob has promised never to talk to me about religion anymore. It was awfully rough on him, you know. He had no idea that there was that sort of thing in the world. Although I had told him often enough, my father on his knees, that kind of thing. Oh dear, oh dear. I just hold on to your hand very tight and shut my eyes. I wonder why God made me to be this curse to my father and mother. If it had not been for the thoughts of you, I should have been twice as cut up. Somehow it all seems to simplify when I think of you. Tell me again that I'm not such cold poison to everyone as I am to some. Interestingly enough, he says there, I wonder why God made me such poison. So, uh, I mean, they did make it up eventually, but it's the drama of his, his, his dad, the picture of his dad begging him on his hands and knees and huge temperament, uh, which he had to deal with uh, in, a, in a late letter to Fanny, which I won't read all of, but uh, not to Fanny, about Fanny. He's writing, in fact, from Vilema in summer to Sidney Colvin, um, about dealing with Fanny, similar, uh, overblown, uh, what's now called heightened emotional experience um, that he had to put, put up with and deal with with his father, with Fanny. Um, just a few things. Fanny is not well and we're miserably anxious. I may say now, uh, I may say now that for no, nearly 18 months there's been something wrong. Um, you know about Fanny, there's nothing you can say is wrong, only it ain't right, it ain't she. At first she annoyed me dreadfully, now of course that one understands, it is more anxious and pitiful. The doctor has been, there is no danger to life, he said twice. Is there any danger to mind, I asked. <laughs> that is not excluded, said he. Since then I've had a scene with which I need not harrow you, and now again she is quiet and seems without illusions. It is a beastly business. You see, though I've written to you so fully all these months, I have scarce been frank, but kept my inmost trials to myself. At first, it only seemed a kind of set against me. She made every talk an argument, then a quarrel, till I fled her and lived in a kind of isolation in my own room. The last was a hell of a scene which lasted all night. I will never tell anyone what about it couldn't be believed and was so unlike herself or any of us in which Belle and I held her for about two hours. She wanted to run away. I'm broken on the wheel, or feel like it. Belle and Lloyd are both as good as gold. Belle has her faults and plenty of them, but she's a, been a blessed friend to me. Mm. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, that's just to, to uh, give you some 
feeling of the context in which he, which he lived. And, and just finally, I'll read you this, uh, uh, which I read last year. Really, we should be calling um, today, not RLS Day, but we should be calling it Miss A.H.I. Day, um, for reasons which will become apparent, November the 13th. Um, this is, he's written to Henry Clay Eyed. I, Robert Louis Stevenson, advocate of the Scots Bar, author of The Master of Ballantrae and Moral Emblems, stuck civil engineer, sole owner and patentee of the palace and plantation known as Vailima in the island of Upolu, Samoa, a British subject having been in sound mind and pretty well, I thank you, I thank you in body, in consideration that Miss A. H. Ide, daughter of H. C. Ide in the town of St. Johnsbury in the country of Caledonia and the state of Vermont, United States of America, was born out of all reason upon Christmas Day and is therefore out of all justice denied the consolation and profit of a proper birthday. <laughs> and considering that I, the said Robert Louis Stevenson, have attained an age when yeah, we never mention it. And I have now no further use for a birthday of any description. Have transferred and do hereby transfer to the said AHI all and whole my rights and privileges in the 13th day of November. <laughs> Formerly my birthday, now hereby and henceforth the birthday of the said AHI to have, hold, exercise, and enjoy the same in customary manner by the sporting of fine raiment, eating of rich meats, and receipt of gifts, compliments, and copies of verse, according to the manner of our ancestors. And I direct the said A.H. Ide to add to her said name the, the name of A.H. Ide, the name Louisa, at least in private. <laughs> and I charge her to use my said birthday with moderation and humanity, the said birthday not being so young as it once was, and having carried me in a very satisfactory manner since I can remember. And in case the said AHI shall neglect or contravene either of the above conditions, I hereby revoke the donation and transfer my rights in the said birthday to the President of the United States of America for the time being. <laughs> In witness whereof I have hereto set my hand and seal this 19th day of June in the year of grace 1891. Robert Louis Stevenson, IPD. Uh, so, A.A. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Nigel. I know that the time has moved beyond the oh, hour at which we were supposed to finish, but um, if those people who want to leave or need to leave, uh, wish to do so. I think if you're happy to take just a couple of questions, if anyone has them from the floor. And there's, sure. there's one over here. You, you are on the, the, the bench there, as one Scotsman and one Englishman, uh, but you're both actors and you have both created plays about Stevenson. Do you possess him? Or does he possess you in the character oh of creators? Good. <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> That's very metaphysical. My goodness. Oh, my goodness. I don't know the answer to that, sir. Um, I don't think I possess him. I don't know if he possesses me. Uh, I certainly I don't feel that I, I possess him. You know. I, I, sounds a bit of Jekyll and Hyde. It does sound me, a bit, yeah. I heard David Possessed. Tennant do him. Uh, there was a dramatization very recently of. Uh, I don't know if you heard it, David Tennant, who was born to play Stevenson. Perfect. Vocal, got the energy, the panache, whatever. The look as well. Even the look, yeah, David, yeah. Could, mm. you could darken him up. And he, not darken him up, you know, here. And, <laughs> <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me. I'll think the black and white minstrels are some human. <laughs> um, yes, so that, that, that is a naughty question, sir. I'll have to give that some thought. I don't know about Nigel. How do you feel about okay. it? Okay. Um, one question up there. And the yellow top. So I'm a big fan of comic books and film, um, and obviously Stevenson's fingerprints are all over, like the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise and the Incredible Hulk and that sort of thing. Do you think Stevenson's greatest talent is thinking almost cinematically about great stories or looking at his environment like Deacon Brody and trying to absorb that and see the story in it? 
I, I think the, the visual, the visual, the way he visualizes events, scenes, settings, you know, Jim in the apple barrel, all of it, you, it's all about, he's, he's a setter of scenes, you know, in a very different way to Dickens, who can be incredibly theatrical in his disposition of scenes, like, uh, you know, the, the revelation of the perfidy of Uriah Heat, for example, very set piece scene, you know, with Micawber, and, and RLS has that similar ability, or other two, to set a scene, you know, I mean, this afternoon, reading the death of Israel hands at the hands of Jim, you know, just so vivid, wasn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, just I, so I do vivid. think he's you see every more drop of moisture than, on than Jim's Dickens, face, yeah. on Israel's face as he's going up the rigging, and the boat's canted over, so it's not vertical. The boat, the, the mast, of course, is rather like with Roy Scheider in Jaws. You know, when he's in his last moment to get the whatever. And point being, it's a great visual moment. I I would say yes. So I would agree with you. Your point. Okay, are we going to take just that one? This is the last question over there, you thank you. This one, um, there hasn't been any mention of Stevenson's poetry. That's true. And he, he wrote in English and in Scots. Do you have any um, particular liking, uh, any particular likes or affinities with, uh, with his poetry? Nigel. 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 Um, yes, I... I um, I read as much of the poetry as I could. The, the Scots, coming from London, the Scots poetry is pretty incomprehensible to me. Um, and to me, I'm afraid to <laughs> say. Um, Some of it is. And the, I, I believe the most successful was, the, uh, again, the Children's Garden of Verse. My, mm. my favourites are the, are the... mostly to do with 17 Harriet Row, the, 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 the counterpane and the lamppost outside, which... I don't believe is the, the original lamp. Is that right? Am I right? Or, or no? but, but there's a wonderful one to the lamppost outside. We, we've got a lamppost, which just captures how exciting for a child, even something like how a lamppost or, you know, he manages to, to make a universal thing out of, the, out of what's close up to him, like the battle on the counterpane when he was sick in bed and he, he, he's playing. He manages to to give things that, are, that, that, that to an adult are small, massive significance and resonance. So although the, the, the poems look like little, you know, it's, a, it's called a children's garden of verse, it looks like it's going to be very, very slight, but um, I think those are really poignant. But as a, as a poetry critic, I'm, I, you know, it's not an area I... I, I mean, I find all poetry quite difficult to read, really. It's a hard, it's a hard thing to read. I like poetry, and I like a lot of poetry, and uh, I have to, to be absolutely frank and say, beyond The Hunter Home from the Hill, I'm really not as familiar with his verse as I should be, for which I apologise. Okay, that leaves something <laughs> then to move on to. Um, at which point, can I just... Um, Thank everyone for coming along this evening, Lord Provost uh, and others. But of course, uh, most of all, I'd like to thank John and Nigel for sharing with us that, that passion, that interest in RLS that we know uh, that they have. And I think for impressing us with the depth and the breadth of uh, their knowledge. And also for providing um, us with some really very, um, bo both I think deeply moving and also quite humorous uh, readings from RLS's work as well, which is, is fantastic. I'm going to still c uh, continue to call it RLS Day. Um, I object to the um, AHI Day, um, but uh, nonetheless, I think the letter was, was uh, quite wonderful. Um, can I thank everyone who's organised uh, this evening's event. And in particular, I'd like to thank Edinburgh University for providing the Reed Hall and the staff uh, here this evening. But um, can I ask you to most of all uh, join me in thanking John and Nigel for a wonderful evening's entertainment. Thank you very much. Oh, And I'm, um, 
and... Oh, oh whiskey. <laughs> How funny. What a, what a surprise. I'm going to ask Professor Linda Dryden to make a presentation. So thank our guests, our, our speakers, tremendously. It's such a fantastic evening. I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as I have. Whiskey is appropriate. <laughs> ah, it's a really good way to improve your diction, by the way. <laughs> so, I, mean, I can't get a word to it properly. <laughs> uh, we were oh, alive and fine, you know what I mean? Or as Thank you, said you very this much. A little Thanks while ago. Oh, breakfast. Breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a rab scene has been special.